Um, oh, okay, great. Um, <laughs> we are now recording, so, okay. Um, but um, something that has been uh, kind of shocking to me, uh, having uh, spent um, really most of my childhood as an amateur astronomer, um, you know, observing through telescopes, uh, my research is all in the domain of naked eye astronomy. And, um, you know, in my younger days, uh, you know, with the throes of aperture fever and all that, um, I never would have imagined I'd be doing naked eye astronomy uh, at this point. Um, but it's really fabulous. And um, I can just about guarantee that you're going to learn something uh, you haven't known before about the sky um, that you can see with the unaided eye, um, even if you're quite an advanced uh, amateur astronomer tonight. So um, with that, uh, let me uh, get started here. Whoops. Make sure I can. There we go. Um, so I'm going to uh, give you a little overview of Lowell. Um, hopefully, uh, uh, you're not too far away there in Phoenix. Uh, hopefully, many of you have uh, come to visit the observatory. Uh, if not, uh, it is a fabulous trip, and we are, um, you know, fully open um, again. So, I uh, would love to have you. This here that I'm showing is our uh, historic Clark refractor. Uh, it's a 24-inch. Um, Alvin Clark and Sons refractor uh, with the original achromatic lens. Um, and it was fully restored about seven years ago. So here um, you can see it in its operation with the red lights inside. Um, it's it's really quite amazing. Um, it is uh, F16, so it's 32 feet long um, in its focal length. And uh, as an example of, of what a 32-foot focal length can do for you, uh, one of our, our uh, science staff took this image last week of Mars through the Clark uh, telescope. Amazing. Um, as you uh, likely know, we are uh, almost at opposition here, just a night away from it. And um, we've got an especially close opposition this year. And uh, this is just a beautiful, beautiful image with lots of surface detail. So um, I think Percival Lowell would be proud. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, the observatory is most famous for having discovered Pluto. Uh, and uh, we might have another talk about whether Pluto is a planet uh, or not. Um, from my perspective, it, it certainly is, um, but you know that's a, a fun debate to have. Uh, regardless of what you think about Pluto, it's pretty awesome to um, uh, explore the story of how it was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh. And in fact, um, since uh, February of 2020, uh, we've been holding an annual I Heart Pluto Festival uh, here in Flagstaff. So we'll be doing this again next year. Um, uh, it's always around the date of February 18th, which is the discovery date. And um, February in Flagstaff uh, is a great time if you love the snow. Um, if you don't like the cold, maybe it's not as good time, but uh, it's still fun uh, to um, go into the festivities surrounding Pluto. Um, coincidentally, uh, if I go back one here, whoops, two here to the Clark, uh, the one of the more significant um, science discoveries from the early days, uh, much more actually than Pluto, was um, uh, the dis discovery of the first evidence that the universe is expanding uh, by um, VM Slipher. Uh, back in 1914, he was observing uh, galaxies through the Clark refractor, uh, through a spectroscope, and found that um, most of them were redshifted and um, traveling away from us at quite a distance. And so um, that uh, discovery, uh, VM Slipher shared um, at the next, um, 
the annual meeting for um, the American Astronomical Society. And uh, one of the members present was none other than Edwin Hubble. So um, uh, that's a, a nice tidbit from our history. Um, and then this telescope was also used to map the moon ahead of uh, the Apollo landings. And for 10 years, uh, we employed uh, professional illustrators to draw the lunar maps um, because that was more accurate and more detailed than uh, film could capture at that time due to the limitations of the grain. So um, some really, really fun things. Um, <clears throat> coming up to uh, uh, the modern day, uh, this here is the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. Uh, we opened this in October, 2019, and then closed it five months later for COVID. Uh, so uh, it is up and running again, full steam ahead. And it's really a fabulous facility. Uh, it has six telescopes. It's uh, really unique in the world. Um, this, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this building rolls off on rails uh, to reveal the telescopes. So instead of being a rolling roof observatory, it's a rolling building, rolling hangar uh, observatory. So uh, it's, it's quite uh, a nice addition to the campus. And uh, we've embedded glowstones into the walkway going up to it. So it's really magical on those dark nights. And uh, pretty much a star party every night. Um, uh, this is the part where I'm gonna make uh, you with portable telescopes jealous. Uh, we open the building in three minutes and the telescopes are permanently aligned. So um, it really helps a lot. Uh, when we have people come, uh, we're ready to go in just a few minutes. We need a big donation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, here's a, a few of the telescopes you can see. Uh, this is a, a Mead uh, ACF 16 inch. Um, behind it on the left here, we've got a 32 inch star structure with a quartz <clears throat> Um, which helps because of the temperature extremes we experience in Flagstaff. Uh, this here is one of two uh, plane wave CDK uh, telescopes. Uh, we use those for Im imaging. They're both in uh, instrumented. Uh, and then this one is, is great. Um, you're looking down the barrel, but it's a um, fire engine red, um, steampunk style, uh, eight inch refractor from Moonraker uh, that was custom made for the uh, Giovanni Open Deck Observatory. So it's an homage to the Clark uh, 125 years earlier. And then this is our newest telescope on Mars Hill. Uh, it's a 24 inch plane wave, uh, CDK. And this one we use for visual observing. Uh, and what we do with this is um, uh, we have it primarily used with um, groups and um, private observing sessions. Uh, so you can get uh, a group and get private access to this. Um, this is located um, just next to the Clark. And um, it's kind of a neat contrast because they're both 24 inches, but the Clark is 32 feet long. And this one is about five or six feet long. So <laughs> quite a difference uh, 124 years makes. Uh, and then a, this one is our biggest telescope. Um, this is what um, uh, is, well, it's essentially our, our flagship professional telescope, the Lowell Discovery Telescope. It's about an hour south of Flagstaff. Uh, this is how it looks on the inside. Uh, it's a 4.3 meter telescope, so about 14 inches, or 14 feet in diameter. And... Um, uh, very rarely uh, we put an eyepiece on it. Um, and I will tell you, uh, you see color in planetary nebulae uh, or Neptune looks as big as Jupiter uh, through a, a much smaller telescope. So it, it's quite the sight. Um, and uh, I'm happy to uh, let you know that uh, starting this weekend, 
uh, we are opening up this telescope um, on weekends only to start uh, for public tours. So you can go to our website and and uh, get some information about that. Um, but that's that's a pretty neat thing. Um, uh, you'll start at um, the Mars Hill campus, and then we'll drive you out uh, to this research site uh, and show you around and then drive you back to Mars Hill. Um, and then uh, this is what is on the docket next. Um, our executive director, Jeff Hall, likes to call the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory the appetizer, and then this is the main course. Um, this is the Astronomy Discovery Center. It's under construction right now. Um, we have most of the walls up and uh, a lot of the steel is going into place uh, right now. Uh, it's a 40,000 square foot science center. And uh, on the roof is a planetarium uh, and there's no dome. So we're using the dark skies of Flagstaff as a natural planetarium dome. The seats will be heated because it's Flagstaff. Um, and then uh, we'll do laser guided tours of the stars and um, uh, use screens to uh, supplement that with uh, some deep sky images. So that's on the roof. Um, inside we have um, a marvelous uh, universe theater uh, with a hundred foot wide screen, 30 feet tall, but it's curved and wraps around you. Um, and it'll be uh, using LEDs instead of projection. So we'll get those rich blacks that you need for space. Um, and the idea there is, um, you know, it's not really intended for just sitting down and watching a movie. Um, we may have, you know, one or two of those, but primarily it's to supplement what our educators are, are talking about. So we can give a talk about Mars and put you on the surface of Mars um, or zooming through galaxies as we talk about galactic cannibalism. So uh, that's going to be an awesome piece, lots of interactive exhibits. And um, yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, this is expected to open in the second half of 2024. So um, there's a lot happening here at Lowell. Um, if um, it's been a while since you've been up here, uh, I invite you to come on up, um, uh, whether you like to play in the snow or want to wait till it's warmer. Uh, and then lastly, um, we have started uh, a new podcast um, almost a year ago now, uh, back in January, called Star Stuff, a space podity. And uh, it's a really fun podcast. Um, uh, each week we talk with uh, different scientists or uh, others connected to uh, astronomy in some way and um, have a really fun conversation. So uh, you can find this um, any place you do podcasts. All right. So now we're going to uh, dig into some Arabian astronomy. And as we get started here, um, uh, I want to acknowledge um, our place here. And so I'll start off with a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, located in Flagstaff, Arizona, Lowell Observatory sits at the base of mountains sacred to many tribes throughout the region. We honor their past, present, and future generations who have lived here for millennia and will forever call this place home. And of course, uh, we've got the peaks right there and Lowell Observatory is here in the foreground. You can see the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory right in this hollow here. Uh, the new Astronomy Discovery Center is going right around here. So uh, cultural astronomy. Um, this is uh, a bit different from what most astronomers study. Uh, uh, most of my colleagues here study uh, anything from uh, near-Earth objects and asteroids to uh, distant galaxies and the large-scale large scale uh, structures of the universe. Um, I don't study the stars themselves. I study how people connect to the stars. Um, 
And cultural astronomy is this broad term that embraces a, a number of pieces. Um, uh, one piece is archaeoastronomy. And um, this is studies like uh, looking at Stonehenge um, or other built uh, structures that have some connection to the night sky. Um, so archaeoastronomy is basically the archaeology of astronomy. Um, and uh, the correlate for cultural anthropology is um, broadly called cultural astronomy, sometimes called ethnoastronomy. Um, and so sometimes this is looking at living societies uh, and their traditions about the sky. Uh, other times it's um, a bit more historical. Uh, for me, I love this because um, my focus is indigenous Arabian astronomy. Uh, and uh, much of it so far has been historical, um, although uh, um, I have hopes uh, at some point to connect this to um, uh, modern um, societies in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, but there's this really interesting connection because so many of the star names we use today are Arabic in origin. Uh, and there's also another great connection here. So this red line uh, is 35.2 degrees north, which is the latitude of Flagstaff. Uh, you're a few degrees less than uh, we are further south. Um, and at the same latitude or around the world, we see the same sky. So uh, cultural astronomy has a really neat feature in that uh, at the same latitude or close to it, um, the data is the same. We have a, a built-in control in that the literal data points, the points of light in the sky are the same. And so all the difference that we see in the stories we tell about the sky and um, uh, and how uh, uh, people connect the dots, this is pure culture coming through. Uh, and so what we're gonna look at tonight is um, uh, uh, a view of uh, ancient Arabian skies before the influence of Greek astronomy in Arabia. Uh, so we're talking uh, roughly 1400 years ago, 1500 years ago, our earliest records uh, go back to roughly 1500 years ago. Um, but this was uh, at that point, at that point, largely oral uh, uh, transmission of, of poetry and rhymed prose. And so um, it could in fact go back quite a lot earlier than that. Um, but around the world, we share the sky. And so uh, here we've got a nice look at the winter sky. Um, and you may recognize some constellations uh, and some stars. Uh, many of these we can see uh, tonight, although I think we have to wait a little bit longer for Sirius here. <clears throat> now, uh, many people have named these stars and uh, there are many star names uh, I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, in our modern sky today, uh, most of the star names derive from Arabic, but some of those star names are Arabic descriptions of Greek astronomy, whereas others are Arabic descriptions of indigenous Arabian astronomy that has nothing to do with Greek astronomy. Uh, now, uh, over time, we connect stars, we create these constellations. Of course, this is the Greek set of constellations here. Uh, and then in very modern times, uh, we actually don't define a constellation in modern astronomy by the stars you see. We define a constellation by um, an area of sky. Uh, so every single uh, piece of sky is in one and only one constellation. Um, this is really useful when we're talking about astronomy, we're standardizing star names, so we can talk about the same thing uh, across languages uh, around the world. What this is not useful for is reflecting 
the diversity and the messiness of um, traditional night skies. Uh, modern astronomy flattens the sky. Every star has one name and only one name. This is not how it was in many cultures for many, many years. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna separate these layers and take a deep dive into some of these stars. Uh, and uh, we're gonna focus here tonight on winter skies, of course, um, but I'm also gonna give you a little bit of a preview because uh, there's a constellation that I really, really love and uh, I want you to be uh, equipped to find it uh, when we get to the early spring. Okay. So uh, we've got this uh, beautiful winter sky here, and I'm going to start off with a story. Uh, it's a really interesting story that has an uh, unexpected twist. So uh, this star uh, that you may know as Sirius in Arabian astronomy was Ashada al-Abor, which means the Shada who crossed over. And Shada is a, a proper name. It's not really intended to be translated. Um, so uh, there are two of them, uh, the Shada sisters. The other one up here uh, was a Shada el Rumesat, the little bleary eyed Shada. And we'll explain that in a moment. Now they um, also have a brother and I'm gonna remove the ground uh, so we can see Canopus way down here. Um, you all in the valley have a much better view of Canopus than I do here in Flagstaff. Uh, and during my time in Tucson, uh, I could see it quite easily. Uh, the Arabs called Canopus Suhail, uh, which is another proper name um, and an, a very old one. So the two Shada sisters, uh, and Suhail were all siblings. Now Suhail um, is a male figure and he was engaged to a woman named al Josat. And al Josat is this group of three stars that you would recognize as the belt of Orion. Uh, al Josat in Arabic um, has the meaning of being in the middle and uh, um, I think it's likely related to the, the very symmetrical nature of the belt um, in that the stars are equidistant and almost exactly in a line. Now, the story says that um, uh, Suhail was engaged to al Josat, um, but on their wedding night, something terrible happened. Uh, there are different variations of the story, but by morning, al Josat was dead. Now Suhail feared for his life, and so he fled far to the south, and that's why he's so, um, so low in the south. Now his two sisters did different things. Uh, Ashera el Rumesat up here uh, stayed at home and cried and cried and cried, and uh, cried until her eyes were just filled with pus. And that's why she's the little bleary eyed Shada. And she stayed at home. But her other sister crossed over the river to be closer to her brother, Suhail. And so she's called the Shada who crossed over. Now, a really interesting thing is that the river here, of course, is the Milky Way galaxy. And Sirius is the brightest star aside from the sun in our skies, because in part, it is so very close to us. And because it's close, its proper motion um, is pretty apparent over relatively short time periods, like tens of thousands of years. So 50,000 years ago, this the Shara who crossed over was actually right around here near her sister. Uh, this doesn't mean that the legend has to be 50,000 years old. Uh, certainly, uh, she could have been imagined crossing over the river, um, you know, within the last few thousand years or, you know, 10,000, whatever. But it's a pretty neat coincidence. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> now also in this area of sky, um, there are a few stars that have a special name in Arabic. Um, it is Al-Mirzam, the bringer forth. So this star here would be Mirzam Ashara Al-Abor, uh, the bringer forth of the Shara who crossed over. And it's just um, a star that's fainter um, and precedes the rising of a brighter star. So the Mirzam would rise first and then the bright star after it. And in fact, we call this star today Mirzam. And so this is where this word comes from. It's the bringer forth. Um, there are two others uh, in the sky that the Arabs called Mirzam. Uh, this one here ahead of the other Sharda, and then another one here ahead of um, the star that we know as Betelgeuse. Um, this one was called uh, Mirzam El Josat, uh, just ahead of uh, the rising of El Josat. And we're going to look more closely at the figure of El Josat. Mm -hmm. uh, we get a lot of uh, our stars uh, names today that we use in Orion from indigenous Arabian astronomy. So uh, we've zoomed in to Al Josat. And again, uh, initially this term uh, referred to just the three stars in the belt uh, of Orion. Um, uh, sometimes these were seen to be the backbone of Al Josat. Um, uh, most often, I think they were seen to be, um, well, later as her figure increases, um, they were viewed as um, the belt, um, uh, but in a different way. And we'll see that in just a moment. So over time, uh, Al Josat gets um, two hands and two legs, two feet. And there's a lot of um, symmetry here in the opposite hand and feet combinations. And so uh, again, this probably supports uh, the idea of the name of El Shozat as something being in the middle. There's tremendous symmetry here. So uh, the feet, uh, each foot was Rizal El Shozat, Rizal. Uh, that may sound familiar in the star name Rigel. So uh, one takeaway from tonight, Rigel is not Orion's foot, at least not in the beginning. It was the foot of al -Jozat. And then when Greek astronomy was introduced to Arabia, Orion stole al -Jozat's foot and other <laughs> hands and whatnot, as we'll see. But it was first her foot. Um, and then the hands, um, the hand of Al Jozat in Arabic is Yed Al Jozat. And of course, uh, this one in particular uh, is today called Betelgeuse, 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 however you want to say it. They're all wrong. Um, in Arabic, it's Yed Al Jozat. So the Y sound comes from these two dots in the Arabic character. Over time, one of the dots went missing. And when you have just one dot below the line, it becomes a B sound. So that's why we have it beginning with a B. Um, and you can imagine that bed el josat, bed el jus, you can see how that um, developed over time to become what we have today as um, betel juice. So uh, also this star was the hand of Al Jozat. Um, and then we have the belt of pearls. Uh, there are different names in Arabic used for these three stars. And it was a collective name. Um, each star didn't have its own name. The three together um, were called um, Anavim or Anitak or um, Al Mintaka which all mean uh, the belt of pearls. And today we have taken all of those three variations and turned it into three individual star names, but they all pretty much mean the same thing. And originally they were all 
names for the same group of three stars, not for individual stars as we have them today. So those are the belt of pearls or the original three stars of al Shozat. As time progresses, uh, we get more parts. So uh, we have hands and feet. Uh, we get a head. Uh, this group of three stars here was called the head of al Shozat, uh, Ratz al Shozat. Uh, this arc of stars here, which is the bow of the Greek Orion uh, for al Jozat, is her flowing locks of hair of the Wa'ib. And then on the other side, she also has a bow. Uh, ladies, it's a bigger bow than Orion has. This is um, well, Kaus, Kaus al Jozat. Uh, and this goes into some of the stars of Greek Gemini, uh, as you'll see up here. Uh, and then um, uh, she has uh, two footstools. There's a front footstool, uh, al kursi al muqaddam, and the rear footstool, al kursi al muakhar. So there's a lot of elements here, and um, this propagation of elements of the figure of al Shozat shows the prominence and importance of this figure. Um, there's one more piece, um, and it's far off over here on the side. Uh, this is the maiden head, Othrat um, uh, al-Jozat. And this name survives in a number of star names here, all of which kind of um, butcher the original Arabic. Um, Al-Zara, Al-Zara, Al-Udra um, are all attempting to say al Uthra, um in the Arabic. And um this central star uh is a bit of a of a yellowish orange star uh and so um it's possible that 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 gave you know some of the meaning of the maiden head over here on the side um it's uh an old star name uh and so uh it's also possible that it was completely separate and then was added into um the Josat story later on so this is is al Jozat, and again it's it's quite a large grouping of of stars um and uh you can see how things grow over the period of time now uh there are some other wonderful stars right in this area of sky and we're going to move just over to the right here to this red star that in Arabic uh, was the follower, Adebaran. And you may know that as Aldebaran. Uh, this means the follower. Question is, what is Adebaran following? Well, he is following Athuraya, or the Pleiades star cluster. Now, Athuraya in Arabic um, has a meaning that's connected to moisture and to abundance. Um, but it's a diminutive, uh, so you might translate it as the little abundant one. Um, and there's some significance there because when Athuraya set in the West, um, just before the sunrise, uh, this was in the fall, um, this was a time of heavy rains that marked the earth. Um, and so there's moisture and there's abundance of um, herbage and plants that grow as a result of the rains. Now, um, Aldebaran and Athuraya uh, have additional names. Athuraya was also called Anejim. And Anejim in Arabic means star or asterism. Um, so there are countless times in uh, pre-Islamic uh, Arabic poetry and um, post-Islamic too, um, into this early Islamic period, where uh, the poet says Anejim. And when you see that, the star, it means this star grouping, Athuraya, uh, the Pleiades star cluster. This was the most celebrated star or star grouping in the entire night sky. Um, and uh, you who have seen it uh, with the unaided eye or telescope, uh, you know, it is a gorgeous, brilliant, large uh, star cluster. 
but it also had the significance seasonally with the rains. Now, Adebaran had additional names as well. Uh, Tali Anejim uh, means the follower of the star. Hadi Anejim means the urger of the star. Um, this name appears in a piece of poetry um, <clears throat> where the poet imagines Aldebaran as um, a camel herder who has a red turban on and this V-shaped cluster of stars um, that today we call the Hyades cluster um, is a group of camels. And then um, uh, Athoraya is a smaller group of camels um, going on ahead of them. And so uh, that factors into poetry um, around the 700s, early 700s CE. Uh, Adabaran was also called al mijdah the stirrer up of rain. Um, and because it's so close to Athuraya, uh, as it set into the west before sunrise, uh, this was still during that very rainy period of time. And so it was the stirrer up of rain. Now we're going to zoom back out here. Um, and there's another uh, kind of love triangle in the sky. Uh, for reference, again, we've got a Thuraya and a Debaran. And then up here, this bright star uh, in Arabic was al uh the impeder or the preventer. Uh, you may know this as Capella. And um, the story goes that a Debaran was engaged to a Thuraya, but the impeder, al uh prevented them from getting together. So forever in the sky, the impeder is always above them, watching. Um, a Debaran is always chasing a Thuraya, but can never quite get, catch up to her. Now, um, as with al Josette, over time, a Thuraya also gained other parts, um, notably two arms or hands. Um, this, this may sound strange in English, the amputated hand, but it looks like a short arm. Um, uh, there are many words in Arabic that have multiple meanings, and kef can mean, it's mostly meaning hand, but it can also mean arm um, sort of by suggestion. So um, this is somehow an amputated arm uh, hand, basically a shorter arm. And then we have a longer arm. Oh, but first, uh, this star down here, if you look in your star atlas, it's called Kaf el jathma which comes from the Arabic, al Kaf al jathma The other arm, is the henna dyed hand, uh, al kef al khadib. And it's called henna dyed because there's an orange star here uh, that reflects the color of henna uh, once it's dried. And this star today, um, this isn't the orange one, the orange one is here, but this star today we still call kef from the Arabic, al kef al khadib, the henna dyed hand. Now, this hand or this arm all the way down was well articulated with many, many star names. Uh, I'll give you a few of them uh, because it's pretty fun here. The circle that I have uh, is in the location of the famous double cluster in Perseus. You can see this with the unaided eye as a smudge. And this was imagined to be the tattoo on the wrist of Thuraya's henna dyed hand. Um, and so in Arabic, that's washam el ma'asam. And then this bright star here was called the elbow. Uh, and then we also have um, a fainter star, which was um, the pit of the elbow. We have the tip of the elbow. Um, and uh, the brighter star, the elbow itself, uh, in Arabic is al mirfaq and today that survives as mirfaq uh, the star name in um, Greek Perseus 
But there were other stars here articulated. There were stars in the forearm, um, stars up here in the upper arm, uh, the shoulder, and the shoulder blade. So um, a lot of star names going the whole length of this arm. Um, and some of those are still in use today. So if we scoot over to the north, um, we are going to be focused on the pole a little bit. Uh, and I love this part. Um, uh, in Arabic, the pole is uh, al qutub but the pole is, is the point in space uh, that is the projection of the Earth's axis, right? So it's the point around which the stars appear to rotate really because the Earth is rotating. Now today, that is uh, within a degree of uh, a star called Polaris, uh, the North Star. And so it's our North Star, it marks the direction of North. But this hasn't always been the case. So I'm going to um, overlay a celestial grid here. And um, you can see in the center, we've got the pole. So that marks, um, you can see the star here. But we're going back 100 years at a click. And you can see that if we go back about 1,400 years ago, um, we have in the center here, that's the celestial pole. That's the, the axis of the Earth projected into space. But it's no longer right next to Polaris, which is far away here. Um, and so during this time, there was no North Star. Um, there was instead uh, a collection of stars that together more generally indicated the direction of North. So this star the star that today we call Polaris, was called the Goat Kid, El Jedi. And then this pair of stars on the other side were called the Two Wild Cow Calves. In Arabic, that is Al Farqadan. And that survives in our star name today, Farqad. Uh, the other star is Kokab, um, which just means star in Arabic. And so we have um, a baby goat or a young goat and two young cow calves dancing together around the North Celestial Pole. Um, there were also other interpretations of uh, this portion of the sky. Uh, one is that, uh, oh yeah, uh, let's get this in motion first here. So you can see that the North Star here is actually moving, which is pretty weird the first time you do this. Um, I've done this with a Stellarium. It's a free um, uh, kind of planetarium software. If you go back 1500 years ago, look to the North and make the sky go for a bit, the North Star moves quite a lot. Um, another uh, interpretation of this area was called the protuberance. Um, Al-Fats, and this referred to the protuberance in a millstone. So <clears throat> you would have the bottom stone, and in the middle of the bottom stone, you'd have kind of a bubble, and the axis went through that bubble, um, and then the top piece of the millstone would go on top. Um, and so this was imagined to be the bubble, um, this arc of stars here, uh, which is basically the handle of the Little Dipper. So pretty figurative, uh, imagining that um, millstone there, there with the axis to be the axis um, uh, projected into space. So um, these are some star names around uh, what we would call the Little Dipper. Um, there are other star names around uh, our Big Dipper. For the Arabs, um, these weren't dippers. Uh, in the Big Dipper, the four stars in the, the bowl of the Dipper were known as the beer, a Nash. Um, so this is B-I-E-R, it's not the beer you drink. Um, this is a funeral beer, um, a, you know, a, a bed essentially that you would carry uh, someone who has uh, died on 
uh, in a funeral procession. And then we have three stars following behind the bier in the funeral procession. And these are the children of the bier. Um, uh, in Arabic, this is uh, al-banat. And so together, the grouping is called banat nash, the children of the bier. Um, sometime this is, sometimes you'll see this um, interpreted as the daughters of the bier, um, but it, it doesn't have to be daughters, it's just children. Um, and so uh, you, over time, we can compare just like we do today with the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper. You over time have um, two names here, uh, Banat Nash al Kubra, the children of the larger beer, and Banat Nash Asukhra, the children of the smaller beer. Um, even though the, the children and the beer are properly um, the larger grouping above. Now, um, in the handle, of our Big Dipper um, or the children, um, each of those stars also had their own individual names. And these names refer to animals. So this star here was the black horse or the black camel, Al Jaun. The middle star was the she kid, El Anak. And the end star was the leader, uh, the leader of a camel's or leader of horses. Um, and that was Al Qaid, from which we get our star name, Al Qaid. It's the leader, um, but it's a horse leading other horses or a camel leading other camels in a group. Uh, now, if we go to the She Kid, there's a star close to it uh, that in Arabic was called the overlooked one, a Suha. Um, you may uh, have ascertained that this pair of stars is what we call today Alcor and Mizar. Um, this pair has been used across time and cultures as a test of eyesight. Um, uh, but in Arabic, the, the small faint one was called the overlooked one because you'll miss it if you're not looking for it um, amidst the brighter um, she kid. And there was a phrase in Arabic that said, I show her the overlooked one and she shows me the moon. Um, uh, we only know, um, you know, it seems to have been said uh, between lovers, um, but we don't really know anything more about that. It was just recorded um, in um, ancient books uh, about the star name. All right, so now um, uh, I'm going to show you a really cool uh, constellation. Um, uh, I am really sorry. You, it is impossible for you to see this in Phoenix. Um, but if you go out into the desert or if you come up here to Flagstaff, you can see this. And it is so cool. There is a bona fide, actual, drawn camel in the night sky. This is the she camel, a naka. Um, here we're using some of the stars of um, uh, the henna dyed hand of Athuraya. Um, also, you may have uh, recognized this as Cassiopeia. Uh, when Cassiopeia is rising, uh, so in the late fall, um, you can you can see this. In fact, um, any night now, it's just going to be a little bit tilted and further up the sky. Um, but the stars of Cassiopeia mostly are the hump of the camel, and then we have legs that go down, and then um, there's a, a few moderately, like moderate stars, not bright, not dim, um, over here on this side, and then a very faint chain of stars that form a beautiful curved neck, and I'm going to take away the drawing and look at this. Uh, hopefully it comes through the zoom. You can see this beautiful curved neck chain of stars. So an actual camel in the night sky. All right. Um, uh, I've got two more uh, uh, star groupings to show you. Uh, one is um, 
really neat and prominent. And I want to get your help uh, correcting um, uh, some things that's in the literature. So you will be informed. Um, we have the flying vulture uh, up here. Uh, and uh, the flying vulture is called so because there's a bright star and there are two faint stars, one on each side. So it's like wings as a vulture is soaring through the air. Now in Arabic, uh, it is called a nasr al-ta'ir. And the second word, al-ta'ir, is where we get the word altair. Now the other vulture is over here, and this is the alighting vulture, a nasr al waqia Now, as um, Arabic was transliterated into Latin characters, um, in Latin, um, the W sound is represented by a V, and so waqia became vega. So Vega is a bright star, and it also has two fainter stars nearby, but they make a V-shape like this. And when you're looking at this pair of stars as they're setting into the west, the V goes up. And so it's like the upraised wings of a vulture that's alighting onto a surface to eat some carrion. So these are the two vultures. Um, uh, many times uh, you'll see in astronomy books that this is interpreted as the diving eagle. Um, so help me correct that when someone says that. Um, in Arabic, it is, it is not diving. It is alighting onto a surface. And these are not eagles. These are vultures. Okay. Uh, we're going to end with a super awesome constellation in the sky. Um, this is one that you're going to have to wait for, but it is going to be awesome. Uh, and that's why I want to share it with you now, because um, it's so cool. Uh, here I'm tracing out the stars of Leo the lion. Um, and uh, Leo, of course, is a spring constellation. Um, and... It's the Greek lion. Now the Arabs also had a lion that is utterly massive in the night sky. This is the Arabian lion, Al-Assad. Uh, this takes up 135 angular degrees of the night sky. That's three quarters of the sky from horizon to horizon. It is incredible. The best time to see this is from like mid-April to mid-May. Um, and we start in the front here. Um, these are the stars of Gemini. Uh, this is um, Procyon, uh, also our um, uh, little bleary-eyed Shada. And then it goes all the way back to Arcturus and Spica. Um, it's quite incredible. And there are many articulated and named parts in this lion. Um, we can see here, whoops, where am I? There we go. Um, we've got the extended forearm here. So the stars um, that go into Gemini are like claws. So it's the arm that stretches out. And just like a cat, the claws come out when it stretches. The other arm is the clenched forearm uh, because it's like it's grasping something. And one of my favorite parts of the lion is the sneeze of the lion. So here there are two uh, fainter stars. They're in uh, the Greek constellation of Cancer. And next to these stars is a beautiful star cluster. You may know it as the beehive cluster. Well. You can see that cluster with the unaided eye as a smudge. And it's right next to these two stars. Well, those two stars were called um, the nostrils, the two nostrils of the lion. And the smudge was literally the particles that the nostrils sneezed out into space. So it's beautiful and descriptive. Um, I love it. Just an awesome touch to the lion. 
Um, for some reason, the rump of the lion is way down here. Again, um, you know, we've seen several cases of, of these things growing over time. And just like a fishtail, um, uh, the stories get bigger and better uh, as they're retold. Um, and so uh, we have the rump of the lion. Um, <clears throat> to uh, reinforce the notion that um, many of the Arabian stars had multiple names in multiple contexts, this group of four stars actually had four different uh, names. So in the context of the lion, it's the rump, um, somehow disembodied from the rest of the lion. Um, it was also called the tent. Um, it was also called um, the lambs. Um, and then it was also called the throne of the sky razor uh, because these two bright stars um, also had other names. Uh, they were called the two sky razors because uh, they're very bright, um, Arcturus and Spica. And when they get to the center of the sky, they're almost vertically on top of each other. And so they were imagined to be the tent pole that holds up a tent. Um, but in the sky, it's the canopy of the sky that it's holding up. Um, so anyways, uh, we've got the rump down there. The liver is way up here. Again, you know, things happen <laughs> over time. And then this huge star cluster is the tail hair of the lion, Helbat al-Asad. Um, this you may recognize as Coma Berenices, um, uh, Bernice's hair, literally, uh, the Greek constellation. Uh, but in the context of the Arabian lion here, it's the coarse hair at the end of the tail. And there's a story that says when the lion got angry, he thumped his tail on the ground and it scared the gazelles. And so they leapt away. And a really cool thing is that we can see the leaps of the gazelles, the footprints that they left behind. There are three leaps. One, two, three. Three pairs of stars that are the leaps of the gazelles. Um, in Greek astronomy, these stars are in the feet of Ursa Major, uh, the greater bear, um, part of which is the Big Dipper. But here, they're the leaps of the gazelles. And if you look in your star chart, you will see these names, Alula, Tania, and Talitha. In Arabic, this is one, two, three, or more properly, the first, the second, the third, as in the first leap, the second leap, the third leap of the gazelles. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we've got this beautiful story, this beautiful, awesome, huge lion. I can't wait for you to see it in the night sky. Um, one star we have not talked about yet, right in the middle of the lion, um, in the context of the lion, uh, was called the penile sheath. It's in the right spot. Um, but it was more commonly called the weather change, a sarfa. When this star set into the Western horizon uh, at the end of the night, uh, this signaled the change from cold weather to warm weather in the spring. And when it rose uh, ahead of the sun at the end of the night, it signaled the change from warm weather back to cold weather. And so it was called the weather change. <clears throat> um, it also had another name, the dog tooth of time, Nab Adahar. And it got this name because there was a saying that said, the weather change is the dog tooth of time, which it bears smiling broadly. And this name came about because when the weather went from cold to warm, um, flowers came out, kids got to run and play around, and people were generally happy. And when you're really happy, you smile broadly. And what do you show when you smile broadly? <laughs> Your canine teeth. So the weather change is the dog tooth of time. <laughs> and we'll end there. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to entertain any questions.
Uh, are there any questions for uh, Dr. Adams? Uh, why don't you come up here closer? So. Well, so uh, I was wondering in the constellation of uh, Pisces, um, there's a star, star called uh, Alpha. And I was wondering if you knew what that meant. Altair? No, Altair. A L P H E R G. P H E R G. Altair. Uh, oh, uh, I would have to look that one up. Um, it could, it's, it is most likely a corruption of um, oh. Altair, um, which, um, means um the spout uh next to pisces we have uh, the square of pegasus mm -hmm. and um in arabian astronomy uh it wasn't the square of the, a flying horse it was um a well bucket because when you travel um through the desert the way you make a well bucket is um, you take your leather pouch and you cross two sticks in the mouth of the pouch, tie them together. Um, and then you tie that connection to the well rope that you find at the well. Um, and so what you get is a square shaped well bucket with four spouts. And so um, uh, two stars uh, in the square of Pegasus that um, rose first and set first were called the first spout and then the second two stars in the square were called the rear spout. And so um, that word spout is far. And I think that is where um, that star name comes from in Pisces. Okay. Because um, if you're using uh, like sidereal astronomy, and there's a book by Emily Plunkett from about 150 years ago, which said that like the first um, calendars were like sidereal. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I think Alpha was part of an asterism, which marked like, um, you know, like when the vernal equinox reached that star, then the age of Pisces would begin. You know, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but, all, but I do know that in uh, Native American astronomy, like the uh, handle of the of the dipper are are the cubs of the bear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think um uh, with Alpha, um that is uh, most likely um, a product of um, Islamic astronomy. Um, so what happens is uh, when you when Greek astronomy is introduced into Arabia after the advent of Islam in the early 600s, uh, you get um, uh, the adoption of certain elements of Greek astronomy and especially um, the figures of Greek astronomy. So Islamic astronomy is essentially Greek astronomy figures uh, with Arabic names. Um, uh, something like, um, you know, the equinoctial points and whatnot, um, that's not directly observable and not useful to um, the indigenous Arabs. Uh, so you'll find that their astronomy is very practical um, and they're not, um, you know, trying to do, um, you know, uh, trying to picture things that they can't see directly. Okay, thanks. Thank yep. you. Any other questions? Okay, we want to thank you very much, Dr. Adams, for taking the time out of your day to present to us. It was very interesting. And... Uh, Next star party, we ought to start looking for some of these things. So, yes. absolutely. Uh, I hope you learned something new, and uh, it was a pleasure to speak to you tonight. Hey, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay.